the ministry of Harold B. Lee. The following account of the life of President Harold B. Lee, written by Elder Gordon B. Hinckley, then a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, was published in the Ensign in November 1972. President Harold B. Lee, An Appreciation, pages 2 through 11. The article helped church members become better acquainted with President Lee, who had recently become President of the Church. The story of Harold B. Lee, President of the Church, can be told in a few skeletal lines. Born March the 28th, 1899, in Clifton, Idaho, the son of Samuel Marion and Louisa Emmeline Bingham Lee, one of six children. Educated in the local school, the Oneida Academy at nearby Preston, the Albion State Normal School in Albion, Idaho, and later at the University of Utah. Began a teaching career at the age of 17, served as a school principal at 18, and later as principal of two schools in Salt Lake County, Utah. Married Fern Lucinda Tanner, November the 14th, 1923. She passed away September 24th, 1962. Married Frida Joan Jensen, June the 17th, 1963. Managed Foundation Press Incorporated, 1928 through 1933. Served as Salt Lake City Commissioner, 1933 to 1937, when he became Managing Director of the Church Welfare Program. Named a member of the Council of the Twelve, April the 6th, 1941. President of the Council of the Twelve and First Counselor in the First Presidency, January 23, 1970, and ordained and set apart as President of the Church, July the 7, 1972. Such are the beads on the thread of his life, but that life is worthy of a more lengthy telling. As towns and cities go, Clifton is ever so small and off the main line. But as the years pass, it will become better known as the birthplace of the 11th president of the church. President Lee's father, Samuel Marion, had come to Clifton from another country town, Panaka, in southern Nevada. Samuel's mother, President Lee's grandmother, had died when he was eight years old, and the premature baby was so small that a finger ring could be slipped over his hand and onto his arm. He had to be fed with an eyedropper. His mother's sister lived in Clifton, and at the age of 18, the boy moved north to live with her family. There he met dark-haired, dark-eyed Louisa Bingham. They were married in the Logan Temple. The home they established, and to which their six children came, was out on the string, about three miles north of the store. The store, incidentally, was the one commercial institution of the town. The string was the dirt road dusty in the summer, snow-clogged in winter, and miry muddy in the spring and fall. Here, barefoot, overall-clad Harold grew, a boy among country boys. There was swimming in Dudley's Pond, but not on Sunday. The father was in the bishopric, the mother in the young women organization, and Sunday was sacred. It was in a similar pond on Bybee's farm that Harold B. Lee was baptized. Money was dreadfully scarce in those days, the farm produced generously, but grain and potatoes brought little. The father augmented the family income by contracting for custom grain cutting, drilling wells, and building irrigation canals. But the Lee children did not know they were poor. The home and the church provided entertainment opportunities. The jewel of the house was the piano. A Scottish lady who knew how to rap knuckles at the sound of a wrong note taught him how to play. Harold was particularly adept on the piano. It is interesting to note that a love for music, cultivated in those early days, later found expression when he served as chairman of the church music committee. A pony cart, usually driven by the mother, took the children the two miles to and from school. It afforded little shelter when the January wind whipped down from the north and mud was a problem when the bottom thawed out of the road. But that was life in Clifton. As President Lee has commented, we had everything money could not buy, and among these were some tremendous compensations. The air was clean and clear, with something almost sweet in the taste of it. The water was like rippling glass, and it was easy to see the glistening stones at the bottom of the creek. The stars at night stood out like people and animals in the sky, and boyish minds conjectured on what they saw. Summer rains were the manna that fell in the wilderness, bringing life to the land. Spring came with vast carpets of green where the plow had touched the soil, followed by the grain drill. 
thundering, smoking steam engines fed power over long belts to threshing machines that produced sack after sack of wheat, oats, and barley. When the grades of the local school were completed, the boys left home to attend the Oneida Academy, the church-operated secondary school in Preston, a long 15 miles away. Harold was then 13, and here he first met Ezra Taft Benson, who became the 13th president of the church. Then followed the Albion State Normal School on the other side of Idaho. Here at the age of 17, Harold B. Lee earned his teaching certificate. That was a proud day for him and for his family. The District Board of Education offered him a job as teacher in the little one-room Silver Star School between Dayton and Weston, down the string from Clifton. The salary was $60 per month. He commuted the 10 miles on horseback on weekends. Next year, the board named him principal of the Oxford School with four rooms. It was a great opportunity for an 18-year-old boy. He commuted the four miles away on horseback daily, rain or shine, fair weather or foul. With cultivated musical talent and athletic ability in basketball, he identified himself with community activities in his spare time. It was in these days when his father was bishop that Harold had his first glimpse of the church welfare program, as it later came to be known. Then, as now, the bishop was responsible for the care of those in need. Bishop Lee ran his own storehouse, the commodities coming from his own pantry. In the night, the family would see him take a sack of flour they knew not where, because confidences concerning those in trouble were to be strictly observed, lest there be talk with consequent embarrassment to those who needed help. Roman numeral, page 15. Then as now, it was always the bishop's prerogative and responsibility to recommend young men for missions. Harold was now 21, having been teaching for four years. A call came from President Heber J. Grant to serve in the Western States Mission. In the locked files of the missionary department of the church is a report to the First Presidency on Elder Lee. It is dated December 30, 1922, and signed by President John M. Knight. It gives the period of his service, November 11, 1920, to December 18, 1922. Then various questions are answered. Qualifications as a speaker, very good. As a presiding officer, good. Has he a knowledge of the gospel? Very good. Has he been energetic? Very. Is he discreet and does he carry a good influence? Yes. Remarks, Elder Lee presided over the Denver Conference with marked distinction from August the 8th, 1921 to December 18th, 1922, an exceptional missionary. There was in that mission at the same time a young lady from Salt Lake City, Fern Lucinda Tanner. She was regarded by her associates as bright, beautiful, and as a scripturalist of unusual ability. When Elder Lee was released, he returned to Clifton only briefly and then came to Salt Lake City to find and court the girl he had admired from a distance in the mission field. They were married in the Salt Lake Temple approximately 11 months after his return. To the marriage were born two beautiful daughters, Helen, later Mrs. L. Brent Goats, and Maureen, later Mrs. Ernest L. Wilkins. The Lee home was a gathering place for the young people of the area. Sister Lee's gentle manner and adroit handling of difficult situations won the admiration of all who knew her. On one occasion, she silenced two prominent men who were criticizing one of their associates, saying, In your efforts to be just, don't forget to be kind. The qualities that had made Harold B. Lee principal of two schools by the time he was 18 were again recognized. Furthering his education at the University of Utah, he was named principal, first of the Whittier School and then the Woodrow Wilson School in Salt Lake County. Roman numeral, page 16. He lived in Pioneer Stake following his marriage, where one church assignment was followed by another. Then in 1929, he was named a counselor in the stake presidency. The following year, he was called a stake president. He was then 31 years of age, the youngest stake president in the church. Depression stalked the nation and the world. Stocks tumbled like ten pins. Credit dried up. Banks closed and millions of dollars of savings were lost. Unemployment rose catastrophically. With the work of years wiped out, men committed suicide. 
There were soup kitchens and bread lines. There was discouragement and tragedy. In Pioneer Stake, more than half of the members were unemployed. Here was a challenge, a terrifying challenge for the young stake president. He worried, he wept, he prayed as he saw men once proud and prosperous reduced through unemployment to a point where they could not feed their families. Then came inspiration to establish a storehouse where food and commodities could be gathered and from which they could be dispersed to the needy. Work projects were undertaken not only to improve the community, but more importantly, to afford men an opportunity to work for what they received. An old business building was demolished, and the materials were used to construct a stake gymnasium to provide social and recreational facilities for the people. Other stakes were engaged in similar projects, and in April 1936, they were coordinated to form what President Heber J. Grant first called the Church Security Program, now known as the Church Welfare Program. Harold B. Lee, the young leader of Pioneer Stake, was called to pilot the newly launched vessel through the troubled waters of those desperate and trying days. The problems were monumental. It was difficult enough to assemble farm properties to produce food and to create processing and storage facilities. Even worse to cope with was the attitude of people critical of what the church was doing and who felt that welfare should be kept within the province of the government. But with prayer and persuasion, with sweat and tears, and with the blessing of him whom he regarded as prophet, he traveled up and down the stakes of Zion, and the program took shape and grew and prospered. The vast resources of today's welfare program, productive farms by the score, processing plants and canneries, grain elevators and mills, and other projects scattered over much of America, are the lengthened and impressive shadow of those early efforts. While government relief programs are under constant attack, the church program continues to win the plaudits of men the world over. Taxpayers have been saved millions of dollars because of the welfare burdens assumed by the church. Profitable employment has been found for thousands of men and women, including many of the handicapped who have been afforded opportunity to earn what they need. Those who have participated as the recipients of this program have been spared the curse of idleness and the evils of the dole. Their dignity and self-respect have been preserved, and those myriads of men and women who have not been direct recipients, but who have participated in the growing and processing of food and in scores of associated undertakings, bear testimony of the joy to be found in unselfish service to others. No one witnessing this program in its vast implications and in its tremendous consequences can reasonably doubt the spirit of revelation that brought it about and that has enlarged its practical power for good. To President Harold B. Lee, its first managing director and longtime chairman of the Church Welfare Committee, must be given credit for inspired direction. In his modesty, he would disclaim that, and rightly so, for he would properly give the credit to the Lord. The Lord, in magnifying his servant, has recognized his devotion and his faith. Having been tested in the fire of those trying pioneer days of the church welfare program, Elder Lee was called to the apostleship by President Heber J. Grant and sustained a member of the Council of the Twelve on April the 6th, 1941. On the occasion of that appointment, Elder John A. Whitso wrote editorially of his new associate. He is full of faith in the Lord, abundant in his love of his fellow men, loyal to the church and state, self-forgetful in his devotion to the gospel, endowed with intelligence, energy, and initiative, and gifted with eloquent powers to teach the word and will of God. The Lord, to whom he goes for help, will make him a mighty instrument in carrying forward the eternal plan of human salvation. He will be given strength beyond any yet known to him as the prayers of the people ascend to the Lord in his behalf. Prove Madeira, May 1941, page 288. Roman numeral, page 18. Honest words of recognition, these and words of prophecy. His story is one of fidelity to the great sacred trust of an apostle whose particular calling is to be a special witness of the name of Christ in all the world. Doctrine and Covenants, section 107, verse 23. In pursuit of that responsibility, he has traveled under assignment of the First Presidency to many parts of the earth, 
lifting his voice in eloquence in proclamation of the divinity of the Redeemer of mankind. He frequently has quoted Paul's words to the Corinthians, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8. There has been nothing uncertain about the message of Harold B. Lee. Without equivocation, and with that certainty which comes of a sure conviction, he has borne testimony to the high and the low of the earth. He has never blanched from his responsibility as a servant of God in bearing testimony of the truth. Missionaries have been motivated to more earnest endeavor. Members of the church have grown in resolution to live the gospel. Investigators have been pricked in their hearts as he has voiced his testimony. He has not spared himself and has kept up a rigorous schedule even at the peril of his health. Those close to him have known that during a period of many months he was seldom without pain. His acquaintance with illness has sharpened his sensitivity to the sufferings of others. He has been one to travel far and near to encourage and bless the saints. There are those in many lands who, with appreciation, bear testimony of the miraculous power of the priesthood exercised in their behalf by this servant of the Lord. He has likewise been sensitive to the loneliness, to the fear, to the challenges facing men in military service. During the years of World War II, the Korean War, and the war in Vietnam, he directed the servicemen's program of the church. He has constantly expressed himself to his brethren on the need to give those in military service the full program of the church, with all of the blessings and opportunities that flow therefrom. He has traveled over land and sea to meet with members of the church in military service. In 1955, he visited Korea when that was still largely an armed camp, dressing in fatigues. Those with whom he met will never forget his kindness, his concern, or his testimony of the overruling power of God in the affairs of men. He comforted them. He reassured them. He saved many from slipping into tragic situations. He has comforted the bereaved. From personal experience, he knows the sorrow of the loss of loved ones. He was away from Salt Lake City attending a state conference when his beloved companion hovered between life and death. Traveling through the night, rushing to her bedside, he arrived only to find her slipping away. Those close to him in the dark days that followed her passing sensed in some small measure the depths of sorrow through which he walked. That was in 1962. In 1966, his beloved daughter Maureen was taken in death while Elder Lee was in Hawaii on a church assignment. She left four children. These searing experiences, difficult to bear, serve to increase his sensitivity to the burdens of others. Those who have sustained similar losses have found in him an understanding friend and one whose own tested faith has become a source of strength to them. In 1963, he married Frida Joan Jensen, who has complemented his life in a remarkable manner. Educated and refined, she is at home in the best of society. She is a woman of unusual accomplishments in her own right. Trained as an educator, she taught school, then rose through various administrative responsibilities to serve as supervisor of primary education in the Jordan School District of Salt Lake County. She also served on the general board of the primary association. The home she has managed has been a haven of peace for her husband and a place of delightful hospitality to all who have been privileged to enter it. President David O. McKay, recognizing Elder Lee's thorough knowledge of the programs of the church and his proven administrative skills, appointed him chairman of a correlation committee to coordinate the entire curriculum of the church. Out of this came an exhaustive review of courses of instruction used over a period of many years, together with an analysis of all teaching organizations and facilities. The vast effort made under his direction has resulted in a correlated curriculum designed to impart knowledge of every phase of church activity and doctrine and to build spirituality in the membership. The strength of his leadership has been evident in this undertaking. His hand has been firm, his objectives clearly defined. The entire church is the beneficiary of his service. With the death of President McKay and the succession in the presidency of Joseph Fielding Smith, Elder Lee became president of the Council of the Twelve and was chosen by President Smith to be his first counselor. While this necessitated relieving him of the chairmanship of some of his earlier activities, the same objectives were pursued under his general leadership. 
Programs were instituted to improve the proficiency of teachers throughout the church. A bishop's training program was put into operation. The worldwide missionary program was strengthened. When President Joseph Fielding Smith passed quietly from life unto death on the evening of July the 2nd, 1972, there was no doubt in the minds of the members of the Council of the Twelve who should succeed him as president of the church. On Friday morning, July the 7th, they met together in the sacred precincts of the Salt Lake Temple. In that quiet and holy place, with subdued hearts, they sought the whisperings of the Spirit. All hearts were as one in response to those whisperings. Harold Bingham Lee, chosen of the Lord, schooled from childhood in the principles of the restored gospel, refined and polished through 31 years of service in the apostleship, was named president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and prophet, seer, and revelator. The hands of all present were laid upon his head, and he was ordained as the anointed of the Lord to this high and incomparable calling. Sustained by the faith and prayers of the saints throughout the world, he stands as the presiding high priest in the kingdom of God on earth. President Harold B. Lee served as the Lord's prophet for 17 months and 19 days. During this period of change and expansion, President Lee oversaw the creation of the first stakes in Chile and on the Asian mainland in Korea. He presided over the first area conferences held in Mexico City, Mexico, and Munich, Germany. He extended the welfare services program of the church worldwide. He died on the 26th of December, 1973, at age 74. End of the section of the Ministry of Harold B. Lee.